She burst out of the avant-garde art scene of the late 70s and early 80s with the surprise hit, Oh Superman, which moved just not her, but the whole art scene center stage. As a performance artist, composer, musician, and inventor, objects and technology to help express her ideas, many of which were featured in her 1986 concert film, Home of the Brave. She continues to create, inspire, and tour today, reaching a worldwide audience with her sounds, images, and creative expressions. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with NASA's first artist in residence, Lori Anderson. When it comes to art, do you ever feel hindered by personal uh, inabilities to do certain things? Or do you see those as challenges to work through problems? I, I, I tend to try to um, get over the fear of blank stuff. Actually, I did some, I wrote some software once for some, for writers who are afraid of um, the blank page. And it's, it's, it's kind of cool. It, it's, um, it's, uh, is a template that's based on crime and punishment. And you start basically with a full page. You start with a full book, Crime and Punishment, and you gradually change people's names to your friends' names and <laughs> towns, dress in towns to your towns and situations to your situations. And pretty soon you have a novel, and no one will be able to see that the template is actually Crime and Punishment. <laughs> but it's... A, it's um. I, I've tried to trick myself like that into making things and getting over the fear of like, who am I to say something or make something? Right. And that's a big one for artists. You know, they, you think like, um, what do you really know that you want to share with the world? You know, yeah. it's like so. When did you first realize that what you wanted to share mattered to other people? Mm. Um, uh, I think I, I had this very weird hobby as a kid, and I just had <laughs> forgotten all about this, which was writing um, and uh, colonial newspapers, you know, just making them up and, and uh -huh. making up stories about what had happened in colonial towns, and then um, I think that had probably been a school assignment, and I just kind of thought, that's a good idea, probably people would be interested in it's like what could have happened somewhere a long time ago. So um, I started making these little fake newspapers and then selling them to people in the neighborhood and they bought them. Yeah. Now why would you buy that? I mean I guess you feel sorry for the kid who's selling <laughs> you know, it's like don't you have something better to do than make fake colonial newspapers? But um, I realized that that you know you could use your imagination and that would be uh, something that was was interesting to other people. You yeah. know, it gets them out of their kitchens or so wherever. Does art have to have an audience? Or is it the expression of That's a of really idea? good question. I mean, I think maybe you could be the world's greatest painter and no one has ever seen your paintings. Possible. Yeah. And that you've never shown them to anybody and um, and they're actually the world's greatest paintings. Um, I don't think we'll ever know. Maybe there's great paintings hidden around. Okay. I, For myself, I, I really like to make sure that it jumps across to another person. You know, I think that that's part of it for me. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what art is, so I would don't try to figure out what the rules are of good art. I mean, I don't really know. I'm going to pretend you do to ask this okay, next good. question. <laughs> I'm an art expert. There you go. Okay. My question is, when is the art art? Is it when you conceive it? Is it when you produce it? Is it when someone else sees it? For you, when does it become art? Um, oh, that's kind of like a cooking question, like when does it become a cake? I don't know, intentionally a cake? When people eat it? <laughs> when they remember it? All of those times. I mean, I think it's it's a... Uh, um, for me, sometimes the, the time that it's most work of art is when I'm imagining it, and I know I'll never be able to realize this great idea. Yeah. In fact, I feel like I've never finished anything. I just stop working on it, because I can't think of how to fix it. You know? Right. I don't like wrap in the bow. Wow, that's done. It's so perfect. It's like now it's ready to ship out and everyone's going to, you know, I don't have this feeling of done. 
ever, ever. That fascinates me from the fact of your recording career. Because yeah, I can fascinated understand the record company too. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, you're never <laughs> done. I can understand <laughs> when you're doing performances that they evolve and they grow and they change from audience to audience. But when somebody says, here now, press it on vinyl or CD or digitally record, whatever, wherever we are in time when this happens. You pull it out of your yeah. hand. You go, no, right. no, it's not ready. When is that moment for you? When you they take it away from you. <laughs> so you would putter on it as long as you had it? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think if I were a painter and I had a painting hanging in a museum, I'd probably come in at night and like work on it <laughs> some more, probably as well. You know, Do, is it hard then when something has been permanized? That's not even a word, but when it's well, been let's make it a we'll word. make it permanized. It's been permanized. Simonized. <laughs> is it hard then to reproduce it for an audience because coming from where you want to work and evolve and change, but now you've told an audience this is a product. Mm -hmm. Now I'm presenting it. I'm an artist, so I want to continue to interpret. Does that happen for you? Sure. I mean, I, I always try to leave a little room like that. So I just wrote a, you know, I did a quartet for the Chronos Quartet. Mm -hmm. And there's a score, and they play the score. But there are times in it where you just go, just play whatever you feel like, you know. <laughs> so there's yeah. improvisation built in. And, and uh, even if you think you're following the perfect score, obviously, everyone, every musician knows that there's never a show that was like another show. Yeah. always really different and lately too I've, I've realized it that, that the place has a huge part in the in the show um, especially outside I've really started enjoying playing outside it's just yeah. so the notes go off into the night and you know they don't bounce against walls it's just it's, there's something really beautiful about playing summer nights and festivals I've, I've really have yeah. learn to enjoy. Take me back. So teaching, it's very early in your career, you were out there as a teacher teacher. And I put the little air quotes up for teacher teacher. You should. Because I think your entire work is still as a teacher, <laughs> teaching people and exploring things. But you were a, you taught class. What does that teach you about being in front of an audience? How do the two work together? Did you take something away from that that you continue to hold on to today? Yeah, I, I, uh, I think in I've taught a couple things. One was, uh, I think maybe the thing you're thinking of is this uh, short career I had teaching Egyptian architecture yeah. and Assyrian sculpture. Not things I knew that much about, actually. Really? No. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was at night school, and I had a job. Oh, I mean, I knew enough about it. So, um, But I would forget, you know, so I would see it big slide come up and it, it would be some temple or and I, whatever, a ziggurat, and I couldn't remember a single thing about it. Not one single thing. So I'd like just, you know, make things up. <laughs> <laughs> and the students would write it down and I would test them on it. <laughs> so eventually I was like, well, you know, this is supposedly history class and not, you know, freeform fiction. So um, I stopped. But um, it's not not before I was fired. Ah, okay. It's just just right right about the same right time the same I was time. fired. <laughs> when you were doing that, had you yeah. already started doing performance art per se? Or? Not really. I was doing sculpture, and this is my moonlight kind of gig. Yeah, the night school moonlight thing. So I was a sculptor by the day and Egyptologist at night. So, um, but I did learn that it's fun to be in the dark and. People are listening to things, and you can kind of say whatever you want. Yeah. Um, and who knows what history is anyway, and what fiction is? I mean, I can barely tell that apart. I, most of my friends have the same problem I do. You know, the, the what's co so-called reality in their life is really they've made it up. And you I know. heard you say a fascinating thing about memory being a filter, and that uh -huh. we as we retell stories of our own lives, how they start to change yeah. to what we remember them as, but that of doesn't course. necessarily mean that was the fact of the situation, but it becomes our own truth. Yeah. You know, the stories you trot out is, you know, the, me as a kid, yeah. you know, and that one gets really, you know, kind of threadbare as you tell it over and over. And was that really you as a kid? Well, it's your, it's your, it's your story. It's your version. Did you really make those newspapers from colonial times? I did. <laughs> Is that just a story you brought <laughs> out for me? I did make those colonial <laughs> newspapers. Um, yeah. 
but um, but it is one of the stories that actually it's not because I just remember that kind of uh, I got a box of stuff from my childhood yeah. old movies that I'm now putting into a movie that I'm making for some weird reason well, the weird reason is they look so beautiful super eight films oh yeah oh with glued together stuff, and the glue is all over the frame. Oh, they're beautiful. They're so beautiful. What are they films of? They're films of um, our lake and yeah. our um, uh, the woods, mm -hmm. where we, the woods back there, and family vacations and people goofing around, and, you know. So kind of just family, catching memory family, family, family films as yeah, opposed to things you movies. were creating and playing with certain toys and um, trying no, to... No, no, we... Um, uh, there was some of that, but not a lot. Yeah. I read somewhere that there was a period where you had had an accident and you were laid up for six months or so with the problem. You'd hurt your back. You'd broken yeah. your back. Yeah. And I'm starting to notice a trend with guests we've had on the show of children at a certain period in their time taken away from other children. Oh, yeah. And the creative process seems, mm -hmm. those people seem to burst out onto the scene later in life with a creative. And I'm curious if you've thought at all about that. I, I bet that's true. I bet it's true because you really do get a, um, a f you learn a lot of things like that. First of all, if, you, if it's something very life-threatening, then you realize I'm just a kid and I'm going to die, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I was in a, put as a, I mean, I broke my back and was paralyzed and I was in the ward with all the kids who'd been burned and that was you know at that time they thought let's just put all the kids together you know it's yeah. like it'll be okay and so my memory of it was actually uh, a memory of it being um, you know how stupid the doctors were and you know how yeah. boring it was and how the mm, volunteers were so naive and you know they were reading me children's books when I was reading you know you know, War and Peace, and you know, yeah. I was twelve. You know, I was a, I was a, a twerp. You know, like yeah. a know-it-all twelve-year-old who thinks adults are absolute idiots. You know, and so um, that was how I remembered it until once I was in telling that story, and in the middle of it, I, I just got a sound picture of it, which was um, uh, suddenly was the way the ward sounded at night. You know, and the sounds of all of these children who were crying and screaming, and and um, and these sounds, these sounds that I had never really heard before. These sounds that children make when they're dying, mm. and it was like it was just like I was immediately back there physically through sound, mm -hmm. through this memory of sound, and, and um, so I, I realized that I had told the story from my own little heroic point of view and had really forgotten the the where I where I was and and um, like a, a lot of memory you know I was too afraid to remember what it really was like yeah. you know it was um, it was so anyway um, that was a, a uh, that was one of my childhood stories that I just had remembered from one side and then re remembered, oh, yeah, there was this whole other aspect of how how afraid I was. What fascinates me about that story on a whole different level is so many of us remember our past, remember th things through the visuals. And then when you talk about the sound, how much more powerful that is, how that can change so much. And when we remember the sounds, the feeling of that, how strong that is, yet most of us remember things through the visuals as opposed to the sound, I think. And it's yeah, interesting dreams are kind work. of often, uh, often quite silent, aren't they? Yeah. You know, they're just these things that, that drift in and out, but the sound can go right to your heart. You can just like, whoa, you know, it's so much more physical for me. Yeah. You know, and uh, can make you dance, can make you cry, can it's like so invasive, and your eyes are just always gliding over things and kind of wondering, is that real? Is that not real? <laughs> you know, yeah. they're, they're really kind of more weirdly neutral. They're not as emotional, emotionally engaging, you know. You, so you're just like, uh. So one of the things I really love doing in, in work is trying to play with those two things of seeing and hearing something at the same time and kind of, and I was thinking. like a lot of times in your life when you're in a situation where what you're seeing is not what you're hearing, 
right. maybe someone's lying to you or whatever, but you're always kind of going, all right, which one am I trusting? My eyes <laughs> or my ears? Where, where is it? So yeah. you're, you're often in that kind of crack of, of figuring that out. That's what's, what's so yeah. much fun about being a multimedia artist. You get to play with those, those feelings of, well, I would say doubt. And I want to just mention something I saw a couple of weeks ago in Zurich. It was a really beautiful church. Um, and the stained glass windows had been remade by this artist, Sigmar Polka, a very beautiful visual artist. And he had cut salami-thin agate into slices that w the light would come through. And, the, and he had taken 10 of the windows and redone them as sort of stained glass but with stone coming through. And they were very, very beautiful, like the chaos of stones at the beginning of the world and then sort of the creation of the world and sort of various stories in stone and light. One of the windows was really ugly and it was like <laughs> why is this even here? And it was one of those face vase mm -hmm. um, situations where you don't know what's positive and negative so they look like people's silhouettes and then suddenly they look like the positive shape of a vase and they're back to the silhouette. So um, you're looking at these and because of the way that stone, in this case it was very transparent, whitish, grayish, drab stone was cut. You, the silhouettes were always wavering and you realized, here's a window in a church about doubt. And I thought, this is so incredible. It was one of the very first times in my life when I was so proud to be a Protestant. <laughs> you know, one of the ones who just has their doubts. Yeah. You know, it wasn't about belief, which I'm not trying to, to say belief isn't, I mean, I've plenty of my own beliefs that mean a lot to me, but I had never seen doubt with light behind it like that. I was yeah. like, this is fantastically inspiring. Does it bother you when people try to read into what you're presenting? When you talk about doubt, and seeing doubt and getting that, that excited about knowing that that's part of what they're putting together there and even they have questions, does it bother you when people look at your work and have absolute opinions on something that they have seen you do? Is there a place? Oh, no. I mean, I, there is no set thing that, uh, there, that this stuff means. I'm yeah. not, any, you know, I, I, I think that everyone brings their own world to every word. Like, yeah. you say, just forget abstract things like doubt. Just say dog. And it, you say dog, and a different dog springs to everybody's mind. Someone has a big <laughs> floppy Labrador, and someone has a sweet little thing. You know, that's just a noun. Yeah. A concrete thing, and so, so we we have such wildly different minds that it's cr crazy that we can even talk to each other at all. Yeah, you know. Where did you start with fascination of the work that you've gone into? Was it with the words and meaning? Was it the sound of the words when you started on the whole audio exploration? Where did it start for you? Um, let's see. If that's even I a fair think question. <laughs> sure, it, it is. It is, but, but you know, it's. It's so mixed because um, I'm, I'm not so much a, I, I think of myself as a writer, but I don't write stuff down. So um, it's usually a spoken thing. So uh, the way things are spoken is, changes everything. Yeah. As you can say, hatred in a way that is really doesn't call to mind <laughs> hatred. You know, you can op do all sorts of things with. Um, the way, uh, you know, context and shape and and um, and expression. Uh, so uh, you can't really pull the word and the way it sounds and what it means apart. You know, yeah. they're they're really they're very bound. So I'm I'm not really sure, um, but I do think um, for me the concept of freedom is very bound to sound. Somehow, I mean, the, I'm just thinking also of the, um, this little film I'm making for RT TV now. Is um, uh, in the center of it. There's there's a long section on um, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, also called the Great Liberation Through Hearing, and that is um, for the Tibetans. That's the sense that yeah. frees you. It's also the sense that supposedly is the last one that you have as you die, so that your eyes go out. Your brain flat lines, you know, your um, every, your heart stops, but the, your hammers are actually still hammering. So the Tibetans take that into account when they yell instructions into your ears. So they yell, "You're dead! You're dead now!" 
look for two lights and you'll find, you know, don't go to the near one, go to the far one. So they shout instructions um, about uh, what to do at that point. So they use uh, uh, liberation and sound are, are for them bound. That's fascinating. I wasn't aware of that. So are you still discovering and fascinated by what you find? Or do you hit a point where you see what your work should be and you're trying to find fresh expression for what you want to get across in your career? I'm not like that really. I'm, I'm just somebody who likes to try different ways to make things. I'm a, just a maker mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I don't think so theoretically. So for example, you know, recently I've just make, been making really, really big and really pretty bad paintings. <laughs> you know, yeah. and uh, why I don't really know. It's just because I really love to make these big gestures, and, and I, oh, uh, what am I trying to say? I don't. I don't even know. It's uh, it's hard to say when what uh, um, an image or color means. Sometimes you know it means a lot of things, and sometimes um, you can spend a huge number of pages talking about, let's say, go back to freedom, for, ex for example, and it's like nobody even knows what you're talking about. And then you see a giant blue painting, like just blue, that's it. And you go, that was so liberating. And you yeah. feel free. You feel liberated. So I, I don't know how to get to these places. There are many places, ways to do that. Yeah. There are many ways to do it. So, um, yeah. So we talked right before we started to tape this, and I mentioned O oh, Superman and how I'd gone back and was listening to it fresh again now, and how different it means to me today, how different I interpret it today, the meaning that I take from it with everything that's changed in the world, where this mm -hmm. piece existed before so many things happened, yet its meaning changes as my experiences have changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that fascinates me. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny, that's a song about really the failure of technology in many ways. Oh, Superman. And it's also about a war that's still going on. Oh, Java. And it just has changed its name 17 times since this song was written in 1980. But it's the same war in the same place and, many, and about many of the same things. And, um, and so it's not so much like the... Uh, I don't feel like it's changed that much in terms of politics. I mean, my own my own feelings about war have changed a lot, um, and uh, so I, I I used to feel like there was not so much you can even really do about it. But um, here is an idea that I'm going to try out on you because I'm I I go to, to uh, I'm part of several meditation groups, and I always uh, lately this is my my um, Cause and here's the cause. It, the reason the reason for this is because a, a friend's brother-in-law recently was assassinated by an Iraq vet, and he came back and he was, you know, was freaking out. He had a gun and he went into this guy's office. Didn't know him, blew his brains out, killed him. Hmm. And I was like, you know, so many of these people are coming back and they're just like, they're out so so destroyed, you know. And I thought, mm -hmm. what what if? If we had like a boot camp on the other end of the ar of army service, what if instead of treating people for PTSD and special things, everyone was required by and, and paid by the U.S. Army to stay in for two months and just boot camp is the initial boot camp is it's hard to train people sometimes to pick up a gun and aim it and and kill someone. That's mm -hmm. not. A very natural, necessarily thing to do. So they, you know, shave their heads off and go. You're one of the group. Forget individuality. You're just, you know, you're you're in the army now. But so they've got that. And then when they come back, they don't know how to drop the gun. Mm -hmm. You know. So this would be, you know, training people to use their minds and their bodies to figure out how to come back. And you know. So anyway, I know this is a lost cause. I know, I know that, that this will never happen, uh, but I think it's, I think it should happen, and uh, it would be a wonderful thing to, to spend some energy, um, 
thinking about how to, to that you can change things, even if you're caught in a war that's like this, which, is, yeah. which really is, I mean, there are reasons actually to be there, at, apparently at this point. <laughs> but then so many of these people are so destroyed. They're so, they're so mangled when they come back. Yeah. You know, so anyway, that's, uh, uh, so I, in answer to your question, I mean, I used to be the kind of artist who was like just making images and kind of going, well, art can't really and shouldn't really change the world necessarily. You know, I'm not I, a proselytizer. I'm not someone who's, you know, out to make the world a better place because you have to go better for who? For you and your friends, you and your art friends? Is that who you're making it better for? Yeah. You know, but I realize also, and um, in, as I get older, that you can change things, or at least you can try, mm -hmm. you know. So that seems a thing worth changing. Right. It, it kind of reminds me of the, the pebble in the stream. You can get ideas out there and thought going and talk going, and it can spread. And as you yeah. share ideas and as people talk and communicate, things can change. Yeah, they can. Yeah. They Back can. The and you can change board. yourself, you know. So it's, it's, that's, I mean, the, the real thing to start with. Yeah. Wow, we are out of time. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Truly an honor. <laughs> Thank you. Laurie Anderson.